And I am going to call this. The regularly scheduled council meeting for April 26. Clerk, can you please do a roll call? And if everyone can remember to state the county that you are in. Thank you. Councilman Bliss? Here remotely in Madison Heights, Oakland County, Michigan. Councilman Clark? Here remotely in Madison Heights, Oakland County, Michigan. Councilman Corbett? Here remotely in Madison Heights, Michigan, Oakland County. Councilman Gettings? Here remotely in Madison Heights, Michigan, Oakland County. Councilor Rohrbach? Here remotely, Madison Heights, Oakland County. Mayor Potem Soltis? Here, Madison Heights, remote, Oakland County. Mayor Grafstein? I am here in person in council chambers, Madison Heights, Oakland County, Michigan. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will be leading, I will be providing the invocation this evening, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, my inspiration for the invocation this evening came from Mother Teresa. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. Thank you. Ask everyone who is able to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First up this evening is approval of agenda. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Your Honor? Um, I'm still scrambling for that paper, but I do remember one. Uh, which is the uh, adding of the pension issue regarding the late Captain Rovich uh, to the agenda, please. I'm not sure where it goes. Reports? Oh, communication? I believe it would be D2. D2, That's, then I'd move to put it on D2. The wording actually is to approve the letter of understanding with the firefighters union. Oh, that's the same thing. Oh, okay. I, I took that that's as two, somehow two different things. Okay. Well, then I would move to approve the, um, I would correct that to the letter of understanding with the fire union. Okay. Motion has been made to add the letter of understanding to the agenda. Is there support? Your Honor. Councilor Rohrbach? I support. Thank you. Motion has been moved, made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Right. Seeing none, clerk, can you please do a roll call vote? Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Warbach? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Soltis? Yes. Mayor Greisty? I vote yes, motion carries, thank you. Next up, oh, are there any other additions or deletions? All right, seeing none. Uh, we will go next up to presentations. First one, uh, Mrs. Marsh would be the proclamation designating April as Autism Acceptance Month. The City Council is scheduled to designate April 2021 as Autism Acceptance Month, and I have a um, proclamation. Whereas autism is a pervasive developmental disorder affecting the social communication and behavioral skills of those affected by it. And whereas more health professionals become proficient in diagnosing autism, more children are being diagnosed on the autism spectrum, resulting in rates as high as one in 54 children nationally and over 50,000 individuals in Michigan alone. And whereas while there is no cure for autism, it is well documented that if individuals with autism receive treatment early in their lives, it is often possible for those individuals to lead significantly improved lives. And whereas individuals and families affected by autism know acceptance is often one of the biggest barriers to finding and developing a support system. 
and whereas to foster acceptance and ignite change through improved support and opportunities in education, employment, accessible housing, affordable health care, and comprehensive long-term services so that individuals and their families are encouraged to live full quality of lives through connection and acceptance. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the city council of the city of Madison Heights proclaim April 2021 as National Autism Acceptance Month in the city of Madison Heights, and we urge all of the employees, residents, and members of the business community to bring hashtag autism to light and hashtag to celebrate differences during National Autism Acceptance Month. Great, thank you. Is there any discussion, comments from council? I, I wanna make one comment and that is um, thank you to our fire department. They uh, were selling these there for autism awareness. They were selling these uh, yesterday, Sunday and last Sunday as well. And I was able to snag one my husband waited too long and they were out of his size. So thank you to the fire uh, department for, um, for your support. Uh, next presentation is proclamation designating May as building safety month. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a report? Yes, and I tried to turn my camera on, but my internet keeps freezing. So I might have to turn it back off. <laughs> so um, city council is also scheduled to designate May, 2021 as building safety month in the city of Madison Heights. Whereas the city of Madison Heights recognizes that our growth and strength depends on the safety and economic value of our homes, buildings, and infrastructure that serve our citizens both in everyday life and in times of disaster. And whereas our confidence in resilience of these buildings that make up our community is achieved through the devotion of guardians such as safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, design professionals, laborers, plumbers, and the construction industry who work year round to ensure the safe construction of businesses. And whereas these guardians are dedicated members of the International Code Council, a nonprofit that brings together local state and federal officials and experts to make sure that we have the highest quality codes that protect the buildings where we live, work and play. Whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical role of our community's largely unknown protectors of public safety. Safety Month in 2021, encouraging all Americans to raise awareness about the importance of safe and resilient construction, fire prevention, disaster mitigation, energy conservation, water safety, training, and next generations, and new technologies and construction industry. Now, therefore, the mayor and city council of the city of Madison Heights to hereby proclaim the month of May, 2021 as Building Safety Month. Thank you. Are there any comments, questions, discussion from council? All right. Uh, Next up is our third presentation from the police department. It's the annual report and National Police Officers Memorial Week Proclamation. Mrs. Marsh. I'm actually gonna turn it over to uh, Corey Haynes to give a presentation and he's gonna be sharing his screen. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. We're gonna see how that goes. Give me one moment. We can see it, Chief. Perfect. All right, so tonight I'm going to give you, try to give you a brief overview of the police department's statistical analysis of crime and responses uh, for calendar year 2020. So in this first slide, the most, we can see that the most frequent group A crimes were larceny, retail fraud, assault offenses, and damage to property. Group A crimes are generally considered the more serious crimes and are most often considered felony in nature, where the punishment can range from one year in jail to life in prison. Although this is a state of Michigan designation and is not necessarily accurate considering many of the offenses that you'll see on this actually fall into misdemeanor offense category. The most frequent group B crimes were operating under the influence of alcohol or drugs, obstructing police and disorderly conduct. This slide gives a comparison of some of the types of crimes and their frequency in 2020 compared with 2019. As illustrated here, criminal sexual conduct cases had a slight increase from 15 reported incidents in 2019 
to 19 reported incidents in 2020. This can also be partially attributed to having an active special investigations unit investigating sex trafficking, sex trafficking cases and rescuing victims that may not have otherwise reported these type of crimes. The two homicides that are listed there, uh, the increase of two over 2019, um, are the ones where the, the one was a son who got into an argument with his dad over the television um, and ended up stabbing him to death. And the other was a shooting that was ruled as self-defense by the prosecutor's office. And that incident occurred on 11 Mile Road near Hales. Burglary decreased from 70 reports in 2019 to 54 reports of burglary in 2020. Clearly from these stats, large That even those crimes decreased from 480 reports in 2019 to 360 in 2020. Larceny and retail fraud are higher in Madison Heights due to the concentration of big box stores such as Best Buy, Micro Center, Home Depot, Meyer, and several others. Larcenies also include packages stolen from people's porches, items stolen from inner on motor vehicles, or other forms of theft from private property or from areas and businesses that are not open to the public. This decrease can also be partially explained due to the lockdowns during COVID-19 pandemic and more people being at home. Motor vehicle theft did increase from 46 reported incidents in 2019 to 68 reported incidents in 2020. Overall in 2019, there were 1,833 reported crimes and in 2020, the number of reported crimes was 1,582, representing a reduction of reported crimes by 251 crimes or a total reduction in crime of approximately 13.7%. In 2020, in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, 945 hours were dedicated to providing in-service training to our police officers and staff on the topics of implicit bias, cultural diversity, responding to calls involving mental health, use of less lethal weapons, Narcan training, and several other training topics. Officers also attended a combined total of 1,345 hours of training at outside locations, even with the because of that, that same pandemic. The FBI Violent Crimes Task Force was instrumental in 2020 by assisting our Detective Bureau and our Special Investigations Unit with the investigation of violent crime incidents. During 2020, the FBI Task Force made 14 federal felony arrests, located one missing child, executed 103 search warrants, and seized 16 weapons that were being used in the commission of serious crimes. Our special investigation unit was focused on crimes of amphetamines, delivering heroin and methamphetamines, larceny of packages, carrying a concealed weapon, and numerous other crimes. For 2020, the special, Inve special investigations unit made 208 arrests. 90 subjects were charged with felony offenses, and 58 were charged with misdemeanor offenses. The Special Investigation Unit initiated 210 separate investigations during 2020, which led also to two arrests for human trafficking, three arrests for human trafficking of a minor, three arrests for possession of child pornography, seven arrests for weapons offenses, and 193 arrests for other offenses, both felony and misdemeanor. The Special Investigations Unit also seized five handguns used during the commission of felonies and one short barreled shotgun. They were also successful in confiscating powder cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, fentanyl, and control, other controlled narcotics with an estimated street value of over $25,000. The SIU also conducted 11 Michigan Liquor Control Commission investigations for new licenses being issued and they performed 22 on-site liquor inspections, resulting in four misdemeanor violations being issued. The Oakland County Narcotics Enforcement Team, also known as NET, was also very active during 2020. 
The team initiated 404 investigations, executed 226 search warrants for illegal narcotics, and seized 95 firearms used during the commission of a felony. Net was responsible for removing, removing a total of 32 pounds, three ounces of the following narcotics from the street, cocaine, crack cocaine, fentanyl, heroin, and meth. They're also responsible for removing over 4,387 prescription and other dangerous drug pills from the streets. And that is for all of Oakland County, not just Madison Heights, in case you're wondering, those numbers seem pretty big, but they're for the whole Oakland County. In 2020, our detective bureau was assigned a total of 2,476 cases. The detective bureau is comprised of one lieutenant, one sergeant, and three patrol detectives. All of these members investigate crimes that are reported. The DB obtained 145 felony charges against suspects and 300. <coughs> All referred to youth assistance. Our road patrol, the backbone of the police department, responded to 26,732 calls for service during 2020, a, de a decrease of 1,101 calls from 2019. The road patrol made 1,251 arrests, which is an increase of 145 arrests over 2019. Officers responded to 787 building alarm responses in 2020, which is a decrease of 189 alarm calls from 2019. The road patrol also investigated 1,173 accidents, which is a decrease of 545 accidents from 2019. They made 99 arrests for operating while impaired by drugs or alcohol, which was also a decrease of 46 arrests from 2019. And they issued 7,566 traffic violations. The animal control officer, Justin Holland, investigated 1,642 animal complaints from 2020, an increase in complaints of approximately 331 from 2019. The animal control officer was able to successfully adopt out 109 pets and was able to pay for $20,760 in vet services for all the pets that went through the shelter in 2020. That was an overall increase in spending of approximately $4,000 over 2019. ACO Holland was able to cover all of these medical costs through donations received, fundraising efforts, and a grant that he was able to obtain from the state of Michigan. The police reserve unit, reserve unit led by Sergeant Kohler donated over 1,837 hours of volunteer time in 2020. The reserves work at all city events, conduct vacation home checks, patrol our schools and parks, assist with traffic control and school events, and also assist our detective bureau by delivering court subpoenas. In summary, I know that I've just thrown a ton of statistics at you during the presentation, but the key to all of this is that crime is down overall by 13.7% from 2019. also has contributed to the hard work the officers, detectives, and dispatchers have put in investigating, responding to crimes, and solving crimes. The Special Investigation Unit continues to be a strong asset to the police department and does account for the increase in arrests. SIU investigations also contributed to the amount of rape cases as being reported, as I stated before, uh, identifying victims that probably never would have reported those crimes. The police department continues to make community policing and the safety of our community the top priorities. The hard work and dedication of all of our employees makes this possible. Thank you for allowing me the time and the ability to share this information with you tonight. And that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Chief, really appreciate that. Are there any, um, any questions, comments, discussion from council? Your Honor. Councilor Rohrbach? 
Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Chief Haynes. Um, I was reading through that earlier and it was, uh, it's a lot of information, but it is really remarkable. And I just want to send kudos to the police department and everybody involved. Um, I appreciate you and I appreciate the work that you've been doing to keep us all safe. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Uh, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Bliss? Yeah, uh, just echoing the same sentiments, I think it's pretty phenomenal and I'm glad that our residents were able to hear these stats. I think it's it's difficult sometimes to understand the, the full scope and, and just the amount of, of work and effort that our PD goes through every day to keep us safe. And then really seeing that kind of net at the end where you know, $25,000 of drugs were taken off the streets, you know, 13% overall reduction in crime in the city. Yeah, I think these these are important things for, for our citizens to be able to see. Uh, I, I don't know if we can make this available. I know this whole meeting will be available after the fact, but if we could also post just the clip of that presentation onto our Facebook, uh, I think that'd be really powerful uh, for our residents to be able to have access to. It's great information from uh, department that does a phenomenal job. So thank you, Chief. Thank you to the department. And I really appreciate having this breakdown of the info. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything they want to say? Any other comments, Council? Okay. Um, Chief, I want to thank you for sharing that information, you know, at a time when all levels of government are tasked with doing more for less. All of our gov government all of our departments are just continuing to step up and to do just that. And really the depression 10 years ago effectively defunded all of our departments and our police were no exception. And in a time when there are calls across the country to defund the police, we need to take action to provide them with the funding so that they have the access to the resources that they need. And I think everyone would agree that we all benefit when our police receive the training and support that you need that they need to effectively do your jobs so that all of us stay safe. And you know, I can tell you that residents and visitors to the city are continually commenting to me on what a safe community we have. And as we look at issues that plague other cities, I stand with our police who put themselves out there every day to ensure that my family and all of our families are safe. And I think that the proactive programs, Chief Haynes, that you and for us and to train yourselves on are just, they're regularly admired from across the state. And I received nothing but compliments about our department from law enforcement officers in other cities. And, you know, um, a month or two ago when that story broke with the county, I had officers from other cities contacting me before it even broke saying, congratulations, your, your department did a great job. And so Chief Haynes, hats off to you and your entire department. Thank you for everything that you do to keep us safe. Really appreciate it. All right, um, I'm going to close presentations and move on to public hearings, meeting open to the public. This is the portion of the meeting where the public is, uh, oh, Mr. Sherman, sorry. <laughs> the agenda uh, for National Police Officers Memorial Week. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. We're doing the proclamation. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a proclamation? Yes. My apologies, please go ahead, you're right. Two. I'm not sure if I'm freezing up, but city council is scheduled to declare um, the May the 15th as police officer memorial day and um, week. So whereas Congress and the president of the United States have designated May the 15th as police officers memorial day and the week in which it falls as police week. And whereas the members of the Madison Heights police department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms in Madison Heights, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems, duties, and responsibilities of their police department, and that members of our police department recognize their duty and serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, 
and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the Madison Heights Police Department has grown to be modern and professional law enforcement agency that provides vital public service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council call upon the citizens of Madison Heights and upon on all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe May the 9th through the 15th of 2021 as Police Week and to commemorate police officers past and present who, by their faithful and loyal devotion to the responsibilities, have rendered a dedicated service to the community and, in doing so, have established themselves as invaluable and enduring for the preservation of the rights and security of all citizens. Be it further resolved that May the 15th be observed as Police Officers Memorial Day in honor of those police officers who have through their courageous deeds lost their lives and have become disabled in the performance of their duties. Thank you. Um, any comments, questions? Oh wait, any comments or questions from anyone council? All right, thank you. Um, I will now close the presentation and open, the, open this up to uh, members of the public. This is when the public has the opportunity to speak to council. I ask that you direct your comments towards me as the chair and that you state your name, any affiliation you have with the city and keep the comments to three minutes or less. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Quinn Wright, Quinn, go ahead. Madam Mayor, City Council, hello to you all. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, good evening. Um, I would uh, first just like to, uh, Quinn Wright, um, the chairperson of the Human Relations and Equity Committee. Um, I come to you guys to, today with a little bit of mixed emotions. I'm not going to lie to you, but I'm just going to be honest. Um, so in 2014, um, my heart was as heavy today then as it was today because that was um, um, when there was the first incident with uh, Michael Brown. And I felt heavy, heavy because I know that there were people hurting and there were people who were incredibly sad. And I was one of them because um, of a personal experience that happened to me. It sparked some PTSD to be quite frank. Um, in regards to dealing with law enforcement and um, I want to give kudos to our chief because back then and since then he has listened to me and talked to me. So I want to give him credit for that and for those stats that we just saw. But I want us to um, give credit where credit is due, but to always be vigilant to know that things, the elements that exist around this country still exist here. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think it's true. And we always see things in a binary sense that you're either for or against. And the reality is that what we need to be is for humanity here. And it's not a, a pro this or anti that. And so I just ask that we keep that in mind. And the reason why I came with a heavy heart is I, I thought about it today is because I know that there are a lot of people here who, who are here who, who can't talk for themselves. So I wanna just say something about that and that feeling that we all feel. And when I say names like Breonna Taylor and Trayvon Martin, I don't say those names to, to bring up vitriol, but to say that like those were people, but also I don't say those ignorantly to ignore our law enforcement because I have a family that is in law enforcement. I have brothers and grandfathers and I completely acknowledge separating May 15th, but I think as a community, we need to um, be vigilant to make sure that things don't happen here. And I know that our department is but I want to put the onus on you guys in no seat to do it as well, because um, there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. And it's, it's not going to happen if we continue to pretend like it's not real anywhere else but here. So um, I, I wanted to, um, to just to say that because it was, it was uh, something that was on my head and uh, on my heart. So kudos to Madison Heights uh, PD for listening to me. I encourage you guys to do the same. Um, but not, not just listen here, not just like wait to talk here because there are some people who have had things to say. We, we saw what happened at the Lamprey School District and, and the hurt that happened there. We saw some other incidents where folks just, they just don't feel hurt. So I'm just asking you to make sure that we hear them 
and we hear them in little ways, you know, like, for example, maybe consider calling us to human rights and equity instead of human relations and so that people feel included and not like it were just like kind of worked in. So I just want to encourage us to continue to be inclusive and uh, continue to see opportunities for us all to talk uh, mutually and see each other mutually, uh, not poke fingers at anyone, but, you know, to see that there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. So I had some other things I was going to say, but I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Thank you. Next up is reports. We have D1 from the CD director, amendment to the downtown development authority bylaws. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a report? Yes, on April the 13th, the Madison Heights Council Development Authority unanimously recommended that city council approve the proposed DDA bylaw amendments that include language requiring potential DDA appointees to first attend a DDA meeting and that the DDA be provided an opportunity to recommend to the mayor individuals for appointment. In addition, this amendment includes correction of minor typos in the draft of the bylaws and the removal and replacement of words such as his and hers with the neutral there throughout the document. The DDA unanimously recommended the changes for approval. If city council concurs, the motion would be to approve the amended DDA bylaws as amended. All right, thank you. What is the wish of council? Your honor. Uh, Councilor Rohrbach. I move that we approve the amended Madison Heights DDA bylaws as amended. Thank you. Is there support? Mrs. Mayor. Mr. Gettings. Support. Thank you. Motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Your Honor. Councilman Corbett. More of a, a question, if I could, for Mr. Sure. Sherman, if uh, I could, if you'd engage with me for a minute. I'm, I'm pulling a, a precedent from, I don't know, somewhere in the dark ages, but a million years ago, a member of council uh, tried to have a committee appointed of council members who were to quote, advise the mayor on making appointments, unquote. I don't know that it was your office or your predecessor who found that to be in violation of the charter in that. Uh, it infringes on what should be a fairly open hand for the mayor to make any appoint nominations. I have to be careful on that. Any nominations that she sees fit. Um, so my point is not to, I'm just, this didn't fly 30 years ago. And I guess I'm just wondering if it would fly now, just from that standpoint that the mayor, I mean, the a straight reading of the charter suggests that the mayor on those committees and boards where she or he will appoint um, there are no limitations per se, other than residency and age and so on. So. Your Honor. Mr. Sherman, please. please. I don't specifically recall whether it was our office or our predecessor who issued an opinion, but um, with regard to mayoral appointments, but in this case, the amendment that's being uh, proposed includes language that would require potential DDA appointees first to attend a DDA meeting and ultimately uh, they might, uh, the, the DDA would recommend a potential appointee to the, to the, uh, to the mayor um, for appointments. So unless the mayor agreed with the recommendation, it wouldn't be going anywhere and it would ultimately be up to council anyway. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Corbett, do you have any, any other questions or concerns? Uh, no, no, I mean, that was an entirely different situation as okay. I'm thinking more on it years ago. Well, in that it was a political thing right. where the mayor was isolated from the rest of council and this was an attempt to, to limit his, his appointments. Um, I, I still wonder if we don't potentially have a conflict here just from the standpoint that in general, the, charters, the charter speaks to um, the, mayor's, um, the mayor's authority and in terms of making nominations. Um, I, can you, is that a way, 
I don't know. I'm just I'm just still got a question in the back of my head, but you know, it, I don't see any reason to hold it up. Maybe your office could address this later. Well, I'd be happy well, with that. I can, uh, Mrs. Marsh. Yes, I'm not sure if it makes the difference, but the bylaws are what give the mayor appointing authority at the DDA. So they technically could change the bylaws altogether, but instead they're just amending it to make a recommendation. So the DDA is a little different than other boards and commissions in the city. It's kind of a standalone group like the police and fire pension board. Uh, okay, but I just, and, and I'm not gonna prolong this, Your Honor, uh, but uh, it, its funding is coming uh, from the, uh, from the taxpayers by and large, right? That's uh, segregated money coming out of uh, the taxation on the property that's set aside for the uh, DDA. So we find our way back to the public at some point. And if you come back to the public, I assume you come back to charter. But like I said, if the, uh, if the attorneys can deal with that later, it may be just a fine point I'm concerned about and not worth saying anything else. <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll address that and, and I absolutely understand your concerns. I think I'm, so I'm on the DDA um, because the charter, the DDA bylaws state the city manager and the mayor. So, um, and that's, that's the way that their bylaws are set up and it's a mayor's appointment. And I think it's more along the lines of, um, they wanna make sure that someone doesn't say, oh, I'm interested, we have a downtown, that's great. I, I'm, I'm gonna join the board. And then they join the board and they've never been to a meeting and they don't know how it runs. Like it, I, I think that was really the intent there. And I know that um, we have had other, not the DDA so much, but we have other boards and commissions where someone will get appointed to the board and they never come to a meeting and, um, or they, they come to one meeting. And so I think that this way, they're just, they want anyone who's getting appointed to come to the meetings, to see what the meetings are and to say, you know what, I've been to a couple of meetings. I like, I like this, I think I can add value to it. And then they, and the, I, think that's, I think that was the intent. That was the way I understood it. And I think that's actually something that, um, that works well for all our boards and commissions. So uh, Mr. Sherman. The only thing I would add uh, your honor to the discussion for the benefit of council is that the DDA like our police and pension fire board fire board is a creation of state law. That makes it different than boards and commissions, which uh, council and the mayor has a point of authority uh, over, you know, subject council confirmation. If council were to pass the amendment and we were to find that there were any issue, I'd be happy to bring the issue back to council for reconsideration, but um, that's my take on it. That's fine with me because I, while I certainly appreciate the intent and I get it, I just had some concerns based on uh, past history, but I'm good. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Um, and, and I don't think this had to do with anything specific. I think it was more a matter of they're looking at different things and they wanted to sort of tighten up and, and do it that way. And like I say, I, I like the idea of people, whether it's a mayoral appointment or it's, um, you know, just for one of the regular boards and commissions that it's someone who has come to the meetings. Um, I, I wanna say that when we did our last round of board appointments a month or two ago, a few people were appointed with the, uh, the council member appointing them saying so-and-so has been to some of our meetings and has been involved in this. And, and that to me says, okay, well, this person has an interest in it. So someone who's coming to our DDA meetings and then applies for an open spot They've shown, they've shown that they're interested. They've shown that they're going to be reliable at the meeting. So, but I do understand uh, Mr. Corbett's position as well. So I appreciate that. And um, I, think, I think if we're okay going forward, I would like to have a vote on this and should this pass, I guess Mr. Sherman, um, you would bring it back to us and let us know. It, should we table this or postpone it? Will you look into it or should we continue on? And if something comes up, you'll let us know what would be the best course of action. It's strictly up to the wish of council, Your Honor. Okay, I, I'm fine. Um, I'm fine moving forward with the approval on this uh, if it is the wish of council. So, is there any other discussion? Your Honor, Mr. Bliss. Yeah, so I I agree with a lot of uh, a lot of what we said. Um, you know, I've been a big proponent of making sure that board applicants are 
you well qualified to serve. And in some cases, that just means that they're really passionate about what that board is, uh, you know, debating and that they would show up to meetings, have shown up to meetings, are a part of the dialogue. In other cases, like like high tech or you know even even planning to a degree, uh, there's extra uh, you know, I guess extra emphasis on some of their their background and their resume. And so I I fully understand and appreciate wanting to make sure that the people that get appointed have have that background, the knowledge, the awareness, the passion. Uh, but I think part of that is is mostly just on the resume side. So if they put in their board application that they've been to six meetings or you know that you know you having you know been on the DDA can say you're appointing this person because they've been to the last six meetings. Uh, I think that that probably solves the problem that I, I think we're we're solving here without having that worry. Uh, and honestly, my question for the the city attorney really comes down to can we force somebody, to go to the meeting in advance of like, can that be language that we use to like, we require them to physically be there before they could be appointed is how it's reading. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a problem for most people, but you know, if you have a scenario where somebody, you know, runs into car trouble and then another person gets appointed because they were able to show up to that meeting, um, I don't know. I always get a little weary when we start uh, creating new rules, new regulations, new ways of doing things without uh, appropriately doing the research on the legal side, making sure that we're not having unintended consequences in the future. So uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Sherman, if you could uh, dive into that, would, would that open us up for any you know, potential risk there? All, all that the DDA is saying is that uh, they would like an applicant who's interested in serving on the DDA to show interest by attending a meeting before any recommendation would be forthcoming from the DDA as a, as a board to the mayor. Um, uh, if someone's not interested enough to appear at a meeting, then the likelihood of them being recommended in this scenario is it's really not likely. But whatever council would like to do, if council would feel comfortable tabling the issue so we can look at it and get back to council with a short uh, legal opinion and deal with it. I don't think there's a time urgency. All of the spots, Mayor, are filled on the DDA at the moment. Is that correct? There is one opening. Okay. We, do, we, did, we did just have someone resign, so we do have one opening. Okay. And which I wasn't in a rush to fill. We're able to meet quorum. So it's strictly up to council then as to how, how you'd like to proceed. I, I'm, I, either way. So I will leave this up to council. Is there any other discussion? Your honor, as the uh, perpetrator of this uh, questioning, I, I don't have any problem with moving forward. I mean, if there's a problem, then we have to double back um, and, and address whatever the flaw is. Uh, but I, you know, it, I, see, and don't get me wrong, the intentions are all good. I mean, you guys are concentrating on the intention of the, of the um, proposal, and I, it's, uh, you know, it's very worthy. All I'm saying is that I have some doubt in the back of my head about um, its propriety when you look at the uh, charter and, and, the, and the rights of the public as, as a group, as the owners of all this. But like I said, an opinion, a short opinion from the attorney would be fine by me. And so I'm ready to move tonight and support it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Corbett. Um, any other comments, counsel? All right, seeing none, uh, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Mayor Grastein? Oh, yes, motion carries, thank you. Next up is D2, which was added to the agenda. Mrs. Marsh, is there an actual report for this? There is not a report on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Council earlier. 
All right, thank you. Um, what is the wish of council? Your Honor, I move, that the, I move that the uh, council approve the letter of understanding between the city of Madison Heights and uh, its uh, fire department union. Thank I think you. that's it. Is there support? Your Honor. Councilor Orbach. I support. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, can you please take roll call vote? Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor for Tim Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Mayor Grassi? Yes, motion carries. Thank you. Right, next up, AFBID award, awards and purchases. First one is from the DPS director, the replacement of a front end loader and purchase of claw attachment. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a report? Yes. The approved fiscal 2020 budget included the scheduled replacement of a front end loader with a removable three yard bucket and fork that was funded through the water and sewer division. This funding was carried forward into the current fiscal year. This loader is heavily utilized on water main replacement projects and the current machine is 18 years old in extremely poor condition and has increasing maintenance cost and downtime for repairs. The, based on this, the DPS staff held demonstrations for the replacement of this yard loader and selected to demo the comparable CAT and Volvo models omitting Case and John Deere, which scored extremely low in previous demonstrations. Although CAT has been tried and true performer at our DPS, Volvo was the machine selected for the replacement of number 404 and was the machine heavily preferred for the replacement of 405. In fiscal year 2020, budget also included the purchasing of a claw attachment for the new loader, which was also carried forward and is funded through the solid waste division. These claws are custom to fit the piece of equipment and Alta Equipment is the Volvo equipment dealer in this region. The Volvo loader is available on a competitive bid. Based on the preceding information and the due diligence performed, staff requests that council approve the purchase of one Volvo L70H front end loader with identified options from Alta Equipment in New Hudson, Michigan through the Sourcewell competitive purchasing contract for a total of $178,147. Additional twenty claw from Alta Equipment, which is the sole source vendor for a total of $17,700. Thank you. What is the wish of council? Your Honor. Mr. Rohrbach. All right, we're gonna try and get this all in one, one motion. Um, I move that we approve the purchase of uh, the Volvo L70H front end loader um, with identified options from Alta Equipment of New Hudson, Michigan through Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Contract for a total of $178,147. And that we approve the purchase of one Tink C720 claw from Alta Equipment, which the sole sole vendor um, for a total of $17,700. All right, thank you. Is there support? Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Soltis? Incredibly well put, I support. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sherman? Was well put, I agree with that, <laughs> except in the first, the first part of the motion relates to a competitive bid process. And the second part of the motion relates to council waiving the formal bid process because it's a sole source vendor. So to me, it would make, it, it would be cleaner if they were two separate motions, but whatever, whatever the wish of council is on this. Um, I'm going to try again. Well, <laughs> If, if we can keep it at one motion, that would be my preference, Mr. Sherman. Can we keep it at one motion or would you prefer that we? I, I, there's another item similar to this coming up. I would recommend 
uh, two motions, but whatever the wish of council is, we it's understood that the second part of it does not relate to a competitive bid. It's a sole source provider because competitive bids would not be advantageous to the city. So, because it doesn't do any serve any purpose. So, on the latter part, so it's up to council. Councilor Rohrbach, the motion is yours to uh, keep as is or to amend if you wish. I'll keep it as is. All right, thank you. And Mr. Soltis, you're still supporting? Yes. Yes, all right, thank you. Any discussion from council? Your Honor? Mr. Bliss. Yeah, uh, if I could ask staff to go into a little bit of detail on the difference between the CAT and the Volvo model. Um, you know, by going with the Volvo model, we're effectively creating the single source uh, purchase because we're not necessarily comparing to the, the pricing and, and, and of the cap. Uh, so if I could just have a little bit of understanding, particularly for the public, since this is a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, just why, why the Volvo and not the cap? What are the benefits that are, are going to be reaped from making, making the Draw choice of that maker? Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, just for clarification, uh, the loader is uh, on the cooperative bid. It's the Tink Claw attachment. That's the sole source. So um, we uh, we did demo uh, when we purchased the 404 loader. I'm sorry, the uh, L100 loader uh, a few years ago. We demoed Cat. We demoed Volvo. We demoed uh, Case and John Deere. And the overwhelming favorite, uh, the two top favorites at that time were both the CAT and the, uh, and the Volvo. Um, CAT was uh, just the, the brand name, the Cadillac of, of heavy construction equipment, but uh, staff did their due diligence. We reached out to uh, contractors who formerly were using CAT and now we're using Volvo. Uh, the cost benefit to the city, the Volvo is much less expensive than what the CAT is. The, uh, the maintenance repairs uh, are, are more conducive to the city. Um, so, and on top of that, uh, the durability and handling of the, of the uh, Volvo loader was the preference. So when we demoed for the uh, L70, um, we, we knew that we weren't gonna be in favor of the John Deere or the case. Um, it was just a, a generic to us, a generic. It did not come with high, high remarks. Um, um, from our surrounding communities that are using them. So it came down to the Volvo and the, and the CAT again. So we demoed the CAT, we demoed the Volvo in the IT28 CAT version and the uh, and Volvo L70 version. And, and once again, it was the Volvo that was hands down uh, the better choice and um, far less expensive than what the Caterpillar is. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Oh, Mr. Gettings. Yes, ma'am. Um, are we going with two motions or do I take it we're going to keep it as one motion? Only thing I can say is we have a city attorney and he kind of thought it'd be best if we go two motions. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I have uh, one personal thought, Your Honor, that'll clarify this. Sure, go ahead. Make it in the form of one motion if, uh, if, if Councilor Rohrbach and Mayor Pro Tem Soltis included in the motion that the second part relating to the CLAW where Council's waiving the formal bid process and awarding it to the sole source vendor for 17,700, then it's clear. Councilor Rohrbach, is that okay? Yes, I would add that to the motion. All right, thank you. Mr. Soltis? Yes. All right, thank you for the clarification, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Your Honor. Uh, Councilor Robach. I just wanna um, note that, um, you know, when I have gone to the DPS and have been able to see the equipment that we have, um, I am always amazed at how well our, our department does at keeping things going <laughs> for, a very long time. They, you know, they continue to to keep those um, vehicles uh, running, often way past when they would normally be expired. And um, so, I just want to say that 
you know, in, this investment is not something that is going to happen like over and over and over again, year after year. This is a, an investment that I, I have faith that our, our DPAS department will be able to maintain and use to benefit the city over, I don't know what the, the full life of the of this uh, type of vehicle is in particular, but it, I know that our, our department works really hard to make sure that it is, it is we get the fullest um, value out of the items that we are purchasing for that department, so. Thank you, whatever the life expectancy is, um, I'm sure that Mr. Elmas and his team will squeeze out a few more years, always do. Any other uh, comments or questions, discussion? All right, seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Councilman Gettings. Yes. Council Rohrbach. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Soltis. Yes. Councilman Bliss. Yes. Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Councilman Corbett. Yes. Mayor Grastein. Vote yes, motion carries, thank you. Next up, F2, also DPS Director, replacement of the DPS Salt Dome. Mrs. Marsh, Chair Report. Yes, starting in fiscal year 2016, we began phase funding the replacement of our salt dome. The original salt dome was constructed in the late 70s, and in 2016, it started showing signs of fatigue. This resulted in the issuance of an RFP for the replacement of the salt dome in April of 2019. At that time, we received bids that were far higher than we originally budgeted. Staff proposed an additional phase of funding, which was realized in the current fiscal year, or 2021. As part of the original RFP, a structural analysis was performed to determine if the existing dome was suitable for any rehabilitation instead of replacement. The analysis determined that the dome was in poor condition, had exceeded its lifespan, and warranted replacement in the next one to two years. In the five years since the replacement of the dome was originally placed in the CIP, it has continued to deteriorate. And many of you may remember during the, one of the strategic planning meetings, I had a visual I wish I had today with salt pouring out the side from a hole in their current salt dome. On Thursday, March the 25th, we received three sealed proposals for the reissued salt dome replacement RFP. This was requested a like for like concrete structure in the same location. In an effort to determine the most cost effective effective solution, we also got proposals for wooden structures. Upon reviewing the proposals, the wooden domes proposed by bulk storage were the lowest bids and South Industries were the lowest bids for the concrete dome came in second. The difference in the cost between these two was much less than we initially anticipated. So to get a good understanding of what this would entail, staff actually visited five different sites with a mix of concrete domes and wooden domes. The respective wooden domes showed significant distress, multiple extensive repairs, and a failing shingle system in all cases. They also have a shorter lifespan. Um, the indications from our counterparts were that the wooden structures were required ongoing relatively expensive maintenance and both on a routine basis and to mitigate expected failures. While the concrete domes also require maintenance, it is much less frequent than the wooden domes. The effects of maintenance are much longer lasting toward protecting the integrity of the structure. The new dome will also be fully insulated unlike our existing dome, which is bare concrete. Although the concrete dome proposed by South Industries is not the lowest bid, and is $29,070 over the current budget amount. It is our opinion that this will be the longest lasting solution requiring the least amount of maintenance and reflecting the best value of money for the long term of the city. Funding to cover this overage is available through savings from our front end loader which council just approved and has come in under budget. Based on these facts and the additional due diligence performed by staff, and the increased useful life of a concrete structure versus a wooden structure, staff and I recommend that council award the bid for the DPS salt dome replacement to South Industries for a project cost of $654,108. Thank you. What is the wish of council? Your Honor. Soltis? 
In concurrence with staff recommendation, I make a motion that council award the bid for DPS salt dome replacement to South Industries for a projected cost of $654,108. Thank you. Is there support? Your Mr. Honor. Mayor. Mr. Corbett? Uh, support, ma'am. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Your Honor. Mr. Bliss? Uh, just for the, the public's sake, uh, we could elaborate a little bit on the difference in materials. I know the wood versus the concrete and, and you mentioned in the report a lot of maintenance that would go into that. Uh, just so that they're aware, I mean, it's about a 13% increase to go with the concrete, uh, but I suspect your answer is going to be that we will save well more than that investment over the time period just due to maintenance costs. Uh, um, the, uh, the some of the sites that we visited um, were there were clear evidence of, of deterioration in the in the wood structure. It was the wood decking, the the trusses, um, all experiencing signs of fatigue. The cost of wood has has skyrocketed recently. I don't know if anybody's been to Home Depot or Lowe's to purchase any lumber recently, but a two by the cost of a two by four, I think has gone up 300% in the last several years. Um, and we could see that fatigue and speaking with one of our um, colleagues from another community, uh, they had to put $94,000 into roof decking and shingles on a, um, I wanna say it was a 30 year old structure. Um, and that's a, and a pretty hefty cost uh, and they're anticipating in the next probably five years to do another improvement, uh, roof decking improvement. So, um, and we, cite, we saw signs <laughs> of, of, of deterioration at, uh, at all four sites with the, uh, with the wood structures. So the wood framing, the wood decking and the, and the shingling uh, all, was, all were showing signs of, of fatigue and, and, and rotting wood. So. With that in mind, we thought in the in the, uh, the the cost difference not being all that significant, I, it was an easy decision for us. The life expectancy of a of a concrete structure versus a wood structure with with requiring um, additional maintenance, expensive, costly maintenance, it's it's an easy choice for for staff to make. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Gettings. Um, I'd just like to say that thank the DPS staff and Corey uh, for going out and visiting these different salt dome sites. I think this, <coughs> this shows how we're, not myself, but all you guys are doing a good job in how we spend the city's money. This is a, a long-term not project, but it's an item. This one has been around around 40, 41 years, I believe. So hopefully the next one will last that long or longer. But I just wanted to say the D DPS staff, I thought has done a great job on this. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Thank you. Any other thoughts from council? Questions? All right. Seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pertem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Mayor Grasty? Oh, yes, motion carries, thank you. F3, for also DPS director, the DPS Power Gate. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a report? Yes, the original agenda item for the consolidation of two fueling sites into one location at the DPS also included additional work related to the safety and security at this DPS facility. One of these items was installing a remote controlled power gate similar in scope to the system installed at the police department. Staff issued a request for bids for the Department of Public Service power gate and fence repair and modification. The bid reached a total of 156 vendors and was downloaded by 14. Only one sealed bid was received by the deadline from Industrial Fence and Landscaping of Detroit, Michigan. 
In their bid, this firm proposes to subcontract the gate operator and control work to the same firm that installed the police department system. The bid was also written so that both systems would be fully compatible and that the remotes which opened the police department gate would also open the DPS gate. This was intended for the ease of operation for the patrol officers getting fuel and the DPS staff performing normal maintenance on the grounds and parking lot of the police department. Based on our experience, staff and I recommend that city council award the DPS power gate to industrial fence and landscaping of Detroit, Michigan in the amount of $22,891. Additionally, a second motion will be required for a budget amendment for 22,891 to account 101-265-9870. This reflects a use of fund balance that was went back into fund balance last year after the police department fueling site. I kind of messed that up. But, and the preference would be to do the budget amendment first because you really shouldn't approve an item that you don't have the budget for yet. So, and a budget amendment takes five votes. All right, thank you. So um, we have uh, two motions. The first would be uh, to amend the budget. It would take five votes to pass. If that passes, then we would have our second uh, motion. So what is the wish of council? Your Honor. I would move uh, that we author a um, budget amendment, uh, and I just lost the wording here. Melissa, bail me out here. Yes, a budget yeah. amendment 22,891 from account 101-265-9870. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you. So, so, so support? Your Honor. Your Honor. Uh, Councilor Rohrbach? I support. All right, thank you. Motion has been made and seconded for the budget amendment. Is there any discussion from council? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask clerk to take the roll call vote. And if everyone can remember, we need five to pass this, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor Grassi. Vote yes, motion carries, thank you. Next up would be the second part of this, um, this bid. What is the wish of council for the second part? Your Honor. Councilor Rohrbach. Okay, I move that um, we approve or award the DPS power gate um, bid to industrial fence and landscaping of Detroit, Michigan in the amount of $22,891. There's support. Your Honor. Support it. I love the heavy lifting to uh, Councilor Rohrbeck. I, um, I second, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion from council? All right. Seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilwoman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor Portem Soltis? Yes. Mayor Grafstein? I vote yes, motion carries, thank you. And our final bid, F4 from the DPS director, the city property Boeing and landscape maintenance contract. Mrs. Marsh, do you have a report? Yes, the general grass cutting contract for the city has most recently been fulfilled by United Landscape, who has continued to extend their pricing since 2007. Multiple mowing and maintenance projects have been added to this contract in the last several years as the DPS has ceased its in-house mowing program due to staffing limitations. This resulted in the contract no longer properly reflect has been in place, as well as the consensus that the scope of work needed to be reevaluated. DPS and purchasing prepared an invitation to bid for city property mowing and landscape maintenance, which was issued on March 3rd. It was sent to 39 vendors. Upon bid tabula tabulation, the low bidder is again United Landscape. 
The new bid was written to provide enhanced services that more accurately reflect our expectations for ground maintenance on city property and a higher standard of care than what had been received. The bid proposal from United accepts these criteria without exception and also reflects a 24% overall reduction from our current actual cost. The bid also includes the stipulation that pricing will be held for three years with the option to extend thereafter. The DDA's right-of-way maintenance program is included as part of this contract. At their board meeting of April the 13th, the DDA recommended that the contract for the right-of-way maintenance be awarded to United Landscape. Based on their clear understanding of the work required and the favorable unit pricing provided, staff recommends that City Council award a three-year contract for city property mowing and landscape maintenance to United Landscape of Washington Township in the annualized amount of $145,377. Thank you. What is the wish of council? Your Honor. Corbett. Um, I move that the council uh, concur with the recommendation of staff and uh, approve a contract with city property mowing and landscape maintenance. Oh, that's what, well, it's for that to United Lawnscape of Washington Township in the amount annualized of $145,377. Thank you. Is there support? Your Honor. Mr. Soltis. Support. All right, thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Your Honor. Uh, Councilor Rabat. Um, I just would like to hear from Mr. Almas about, um, just kind of for the public, uh, for the sake of the public, but what's the benefit of the city contracting this out rather than giving it to city staff to do? And how does that um, you know, affect the overall cost and so forth? Uh, plain and simple, city staff can't meet the demand uh, that, um, that a contractor can do. Um, a, a landscaping contractor will show up at, on, on the job site at, at seven o'clock in the morning and start mowing and they will mow for 14 hours in a day. Um, the, for for city, city staff to meet that demand of, of all the features that we have in the, in the if it's the right of ways, if it's uh, the parks, the facilities and other special locations around the city, um, we'd have to have uh, a larger staff uh, doing that and more hours in the day to do it. Um, it was something, um, contracting our grass services out was something that we tried to hold on to years ago. And it was the first week that United was in the city doing our parks and the, the, the professionalism that they, uh, the, the way that they mowed our, our parks and the straight lines and um, the, the aesthetics that, that they provided and what they were doing. It was, it was very difficult and always difficult to match that uh, and what they provided. So, uh, and I wanna add about uh, United uh, Lawnscape. Back in, it was, I think 2019, we had a month of June that was just rain day after rain day after rain day and our surrounding cities, they, they couldn't get into their, into their parks to mow their parks or their facilities because it was so wet. United changed their ways. They, they brought out smaller equipment, uh, the walk behinds, and they got our parks mode. So uh, they have a clear understanding of, of the uh, performance expectations uh, and what we have in the city. Uh, and we will hold them accountable uh, to meet our performance expectations. Um, wholeheartedly agree with, with, uh, with uh, awarding United uh, this bid. Any other questions, comments from council? Seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor Potem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Mayor Gracie. Oh, yes, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up is the 
approval of the minutes. First one is special city council uh, meeting minutes of April 12th. What is the wish of council? Thank you, Roger. Mr. Bliss? I move that we approve the minutes of the special city council meeting of 4-12-21 as printed. Thank you. Is there support? Mayor Gresting. Mr. Gettings? Uh, I'll support. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Councilman Corbett? Yes. Councilman Gettings? Yes. Councilor Rohrbeck? Yes. Mayor Potem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman, Councilwoman Clark? Yes. Mayor Gresty? But yes, motion carries, thank you. And last we have the regular city council meeting minutes of April 12th, 2021. Uh, what is the wish council? Your Honor. Bliss. Uh, I move that we adopt the minutes of the regular council meeting of 4 12 21 as printed. Thank you. Support. Your Honor. Full test. Support. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, can you please take a roll call vote? Councilman Gettys? Yes. Councilor Rohrbach? Yes. Mayor Potem Soltis? Yes. Councilman Bliss? Yes. Councilman Clark? Yes. Councilman Corbett? Yes. Mayor Grasty? Oh, yes, motion carries, thank you. That is it for the regular uh, business of council. So I now invite closing comments from council, starting with Mr. Corbett. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, comments, actually, maybe just one. Um, I wanted to uh, apologize. I was not able. I had a last minute uh, thing come up the other evening that I simply physically couldn't be in a position to attend the meeting, um, uh, the, the special meeting regarding the budget. However, uh, I have had input throughout the process, and I've, I talk frequently on the topic with Mrs. Marsh. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the document that will be moving forward over the next uh, few months towards adoption. I think it really does reflect some of the best ideas that this council has developed. And um, it, it's, um, it's efficient. Um, it contains a number of initiatives, not to mention uh, some quality of life projects that I think are long overdue. Um, so it, it's a good document. Maybe there's uh, some more tweaking that will be required as we get closer to the July 1st uh, deadline. But uh, I think it's an excellent document. And I think if the public has a chance, it really should. I know that, you know, paint drawing and reading budgets are on the same order, but uh, maybe take a few minutes to kind of flip through it. And if you've got any questions, I'm sure any member of council would be welcome to explain uh, or Mrs. Marsh and staff. But it's it's a good document. I think it contains really some of the, really it's distilled number of the great idea that, is, that you've heard kicked around at the table over the last few months. So it's a document I'm proud of and I'm sure when it comes to uh, fruition in a couple months, we'll be all set. So uh, really that's all I have this evening, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Bliss. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, just one thing this evening. Um, you know, we're a little ways out from the end of the school year, but it's not that far enough. Uh, and so one of the things that I'd like to, to ask, you know, is assuming my colleagues uh, would be, uh, you know, game and in favor for it. Uh, I'd like to have a resolution thanking and congratulating our three school district for all of the hard work that they've endured. Uh, this year has been particularly challenging. Our school districts are balancing both in-person learning and virtual learning. The staff, the you know, Board of Education members, they've had to make some really, really tough choices to be able to uh, both keep their staff and our children safe. And I'm, I, I couldn't be prouder of them. I couldn't be more thankful. Uh, and I'd, I'd love for us to you know, have at least a couple members from the district out to a council meeting. Uh, it'd be great if they could give a very short presentation 
on some of the, the successes and, and some of the awesome things that they've done this year, uh, just so that the public can be you know, made even more aware. And I'd love to give them a thank you slash congratulatory resolution from us for all of that hard work and not just keeping the staff safe, but also still continuing to educate all of our children, whether in person or virtually throughout this pandemic, which I know was no small task. Thank you. Councilor Borbach. Thank you. Um, I just want to note a few things. Um, this coming Saturday, May 1st, um, is the, or first of all, May, um, April 30th, this Friday is Arbor Day. And um, in order, in, in part of our celebration of becoming a Tree City USA, we're having um, an Arbor Day celebration the next day on May 1st. Um, that's that Saturday um, at Sunset Park. We're going to be planting a ceremonial tree and um, it is going to coincide with um, like soon after that, uh, a planting about 75 trees in the neighborhood nearby. Um, and I'm really pleased to be seeing, to, to have that happening. Um, I invite the public to join us um, for the tree planting ceremony. And um, uh, it will be at Sunset Park at one o'clock on Saturday. So anybody is welcome to join us. If you do join us, please, um, you know, stay socially distant and, and wear a mask. Um, also, I'm going to, um, Encourage everyone, if you haven't done it yet, to get vaccinated. There have been opportunities for walk-in clinics recently right here in our city. Thank you, Mayor uh, Grafstein, for making sure those are happening. I appreciate that. And I uh, would just really encourage everybody to do it. Um, I recently uh, had my mother recently encountered someone who was COVID positive and she didn't know it. And um, But I am feeling good because my mother is fully vaccinated. And so I'm not as worried about her getting sick anymore. Um, I also want to say thank you to all the, those that participated in the 5K last weekend, um, a great event. Um, I am not a runner, so I was not there running, but um, <laughs> good job to all of you that did. And um, um, I am a walker though. So on um, Tuesday, uh, May 11th is the first Treads on Tuesday Walking Club. Um, we're meeting at the Civic Center, um, at the gazebo in front of Civic Center, and we'll walk at Civic Center Park together. It is open to everybody. Um, please join us at 7 p.m. on the um, May 11th. Um, young and old, um, we will enjoy, and I, I'm sure we'll get shirts at some point. Um, I also want to note that there is... Um, a native plant sale that is being planned for the end of May. And um, there will be, um, keep an eye out for information about pre-orders for that native plant sale. So you can plan your gardens and figure out what you wanna order before you get there and they'll have them all boxed up and ready to go so that you can just come pick them up and um, and the funds from that sale will go towards the Bloom Project and the ECC to plant more native gardens here in our city. Um, I also want to note that the Friends of the Library are an awesome group that are doing some really great things, but they have a kids book and paperback book pop-up sale that is coming in May, May 22nd as well from like one to four. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And um, they have changed the way that they do their, their pop-up sales typically now. So it's a give what you want, what you think it's worth. Um, so anybody's welcome to come and find some great books for their family. Um, and then my last thing was Muse. <laughs> I wrote down Muse because I was thinking we approved the salt dome and the last dome lasted for about 40 years. And, you know, in 40 years from now, it's going to be 2061. And um, maybe we won't, we won't even have cars. Maybe we'll have flying vehicles and we won't need ice domes anymore. Anyway. Have a great night. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Sherman, anything you'd like to add? No, nothing to add this evening, Madam Mayor, thank you. All right, thank you. Mrs. Marsh? Uh, no, I had, a, I had a list of events, but I think between Emily and probably Bob Giddings, those are all gonna be covered, so nothing this evening. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Rotman, anything from the clerk's office? 
just a quick couple of comments that uh, the city recent the city council recently reinstated the crime commission and we are actively seeking applicants to serve on that board so if you are interested in serving on that board please visit our website and fill out an online application or you can call the clerk's office and be happy to send you one um, and then also just a quick update at the last council meeting there was some concern ex expressed about some election legislation that was um, going to be forthcoming at the state. I have just recently completed my analysis of that. That information is coming to council soon. And that I have also been attending the Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks Legislative Committee, as well as organizing the Oakland County Clerks Association regarding this legislation. So more information will be forthcoming as I have it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Gettings? And yes, Mrs. Mayor, um, Mrs. Marsh uh, kind of put me on the spot, but I'll try to cover anything coming up. The, the, the fun run or whatever was last weekend. I think 80 people showed up. That was great. Um, Mr. Bliss might be able to expand on this. The June tune, is that how you say it, or Juneteen? It's coming up in June. And what day is that, Mark? That's the 19th. 19th, okay. I'm sure that'll be well attended. And we have a golf come a golf uh, tournament coming up. Two of them, one with the city. And that what's that date, uh, Melissa? Um, it's July the 30th. I think it's the last Friday of July. And the chamber golf outing is June the 25th. That was my next question. Uh, that's all about the events that I can think of. And that's all I have for this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Clark? Yes, hi. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to thank uh, Mr. Quinn Wright for coming to tonight's meeting and speaking his truth. I know it's not easy um, to speak about things that affect us emotionally like that. And I know as a person of color, um, the past year has been very intense um, in facing some of these truths. So I just wanted to thank him for coming out and say that and follow it up with um, 181 black people have been murdered by the police since George Floyd's death. And it's still completely unacceptable. You'll see from um, Chief Haynes' uh, presentation this evening, the very first slide he showed, he showed all the efforts our police department is putting into making sure that this isn't a problem in our police department. And I commend that greatly. I think that it will go a long way for our police department to also condemn the actions of police officers and police departments that have this as a problem. I think when other police officers stand out against crimes against black people and other marginalized people in the community, it shows our community that we do have a strong police department that is indeed there to serve and protect all of its people. So thank you, Quinn, for coming and saying all that tonight. Thank you, Chief Haynes, for keeping a top-notch PD. And if you guys could make a statement to our community, letting them know that we are against police violence against anybody in the community, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Soltis? Yeah, so every, uh, every year I talk on when we give uh, a proclamation for the National Police Officers in Memorial Week. Um, each year I, I go over, uh, I think, uh, what are statistics that need to be talked about, um, especially um, deaths in the line of duty. Um, so we, if we look at 2020, there were recorded 360 fallen officers that were fallen across or killed across this country. Um, in 2021, in just a few months, there's been 103. Um, and if you look at the breakdown, there's about 17 that were died in gunfire. Uh, and the rest were motorcycle crash, stabbing. Um, and then actually there's been about 13 were killed by um, by a, a vehicle of some sort. Uh, they were ran ran down. So um, I, I just think um, you know our police department. I agree with the rest of the council. Our police department is is top notch. It's fantastic. Um, th that's what we wanted, and they they are giving exactly what 
we asked for. We started SIU, which you see by the data. Uh, it's an incredible undertaking by the chief and, and the police department, our police department. And we're, we're just, it's doing exactly what we wanted to do. Um, and, and so I can't be prouder of our um, men and women in blue um, and what they do, as well as the, uh, the ones that take uh, the 911 calls um, operators. Uh, they do a fantastic job under such tremendous stress. Uh, uh, like I've said before, I, I work the EMS and it's, uh, it's incredible stress at times. Um, things become uh, crazy and, and havoc. And um, so, you know, their, their, their expertise and their professionalism is, is um, beyond compare. And so um, I just wanted to make uh, some little comments about other officers. I did go to, well, since COVID, they haven't had it. At least I, I don't think they have had it every year. Um, there's a church in, in Hazel Park that puts on the, uh, the blue light memorial for all the fallen officers. And so the families would come um, to this, to this uh, get together. It's kind of a mass and um, it's, just, it's just incredible. Um, the, the pain that some of these families are still going through um, with their uh, loved ones being uh, struck down in the line of duty. In fact, I sat next to a, a relative of the um, a young guy. Uh, he was a Wayne State uh, police officer and he was senselessly struck down and killed. And um, um, it's, it's just very heart aching uh, to see that. But um, I think everyone should at least uh, make an attempt to visit it at some point in time. But um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got a few things um, touch on uh, the vaccines. So I think at this point, anyone who is able to get out to get a vaccine, um, anyone who is able and who is eligible is, is getting one. Um, is, you know, a couple of months ago, the big issue was finding a place to get the vaccine. And um, I had to leave the city. My family had to leave the city. Just there wasn't anything here. There, was, there weren't things necessarily close. I was hearing people uh, who were going out of state, who were driving four hours away. And over the last month, that has significantly changed. Uh, the pharmacy shop now has walk-in for Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, which is, um, they're, they're no longer pausing that. That one is available again. So uh, he sent me a message this afternoon that he's got all three of them available for walk-ins. So um, if you want to just go, you can get there. There's a lot of places getting appointments. I held another clinic today at the Venetian Club. Uh, when we did this a few weeks ago, it was 300 doses of Pfizer. I specifically picked Pfizer because the 16 and 17 year olds were able to do that. And within 24 hours, it was full. Um, the, uh, the pharmacist called me last week and said, I have another 400. And I said, that's great. It will fill up again. And it didn't. Uh, we had just over 100 people who came through today. And over time, you know, we reduced that number from 400 down so that they weren't they weren't going to have any that were wasted. And I think it's just that people are able to get at so many places. So if you're still on the fence, you know, do your research. Um, you know, you need to do what works for you. But if you do want to move ahead and uh, and get the vaccine, there are multiple places that you can get it now. There, there seems to be almost a surplus. Um, so just uh, thank you to everyone who is uh, who is helping and who helped get out the word about uh, about these clinics. Um, I also want to uh, talk about the 5K. So I am not much of a runner, but I ran. Um, my first 5k in that I ran, walked, ran, walked back and forth, back and forth, started with the run, ended with the run, did a walk. I, I think I probably ran about two miles in there, but it, it was everybody. There was, you know, someone was there with that. He had his, his, uh, his child in a stroller. You know, there were people who were younger, older. There's a lot of different people there. Um, I talked to someone who came in from Mount Clemens. He said this was the only one he could find in the area. Um, so it was nice to, uh, to get out and to do that. Um, and the weather cooperated, which was great because so often we have rain for that. So that was, uh, that was really great. So thank you to Brooke Heisler and everyone who, who put that on. Um, also want to talk about our police department. Um, Chief Haynes, again, you guys are doing a great job. I, I'm getting, because I'm getting so many compliments. And I also want to um, 
talk a little bit about uh, child abuse prevention. So I think Mr. Soltis just mentioned it last time I'm wearing my pinwheel for um, child, child abuse prevention month. I was contacted, I wanna be very careful how I say this because I wanna keep an anonymity, but I was contacted by a mother um, who was the victim of um, abuse. And um, she had nothing but good to say about our police department. The police came and um, she was grateful. I am grateful and there's children. And um, you know, so often we think about the adults and we think about a woman who's being abused. And you have to remember that a child who grows up with abuse is going to grow up thinking that this is normal. It's normal for them to become an abuser. It's normal for them to be abused. Doesn't always happen that way, but so often um, it does. So the police came in and I said to her, she contacted me after the fact, and I said to her, don't ever be scared to call the police. Their job is to protect you. They will protect you. They will protect your children. So I just, I, I, I know, so I'm saying this to everybody. Um, if you are concerned about calling the police, um, if you feel you are in danger, our police are there to protect you and to protect your children. Um, what else? Okay. This is, um, you know, this is the police officers Memorial Week proclamation and it, we did the proclamation, but it, it got me thinking um, in September, it will be 20 years since 9-11. And I don't know what we can do, but I would like to somehow commemorate um, our first responders, uh, you know, and so I'm open to suggestions. I, I don't know what the world is gonna look like COVID wise. So um, I'm open to suggestions. So if anyone is interested, anyone in the public is interested um, in um, it's something that, that I would like to do. Um, this Saturday, as uh, Councillor Rohrbach mentioned, we will be doing the Arbor Day uh, tree planting. Uh, I don't think, well, last year in June, we did um, the trees on Mulan. Um, we did that with the ECC and we had uh, men's club and some other volunteers who came out. And then the year before that, I think uh, Sean Valentine and I joined a couple of other DPS at Wildwood and we planted a tree. We just, we weren't really sure what we wanted to do, but I knew we wanted to do something. So I think it's great that um, we've been able to push this every year to do something else and to do something bigger. And now uh, we're doing Arbor Day, we're part of this program. So I think that's great. I will be there at one o'clock. I will be coming from the Mexican Day Festival that they're having a drive-through for, um, children's day so i if you go online i think it's only on facebook i think it's the only place i saw it but there's information there um if you are interested in participating in that it uh, it starts at 10 and it's a drive-through it's uh, similar to the way that the tree lighting was set up i think they're following a similar format um and then just uh last last meeting we um we approved fifty thousand for the fitness court uh we're still looking for another fifty thousand. I've talked to a business who is interested in donating 10,000. So hopefully we're only looking for 40. Um, so if you're interested in being a sponsor for that, please reach out, let me know. You can contact myself, you can talk to, contact Mrs. Marsh, um, but really excited about that, uh, that coming to the city. And then um, I've, I'm interested in doing some kind of something with bikes around the city. Um, I know a few people go biking. Um, we've got the different trails and I know we have runners here and this might be a question or something for um, Councillor Rohrbach to think of when she's doing her walking group. But um, I've come across uh, a program. It's not really a fundraiser. It's just more of an awareness. And it's um, the goal is to bike 60 miles within the month of June. So uh, if anyone has thoughts about how we can do that in the city, and um, one of the things I was really hoping to do, and again, I have no idea how this would be, and this might be something that um, the HREC might want to look at, but it was involving uh, people of all abilities. You've got um, 
uh, kids and adults who need to use the tricycle. Sometimes as people get older um, and they have balance issues, some, sometimes just youth have different balance issues and they need the tricycles. And I know that there are a few in the city. I go biking and I see them. Um, so if we can somehow come up with something to do that, it would be a very low key something, but uh, it was just a thought that I had. Um, it would be really neat if we could, if we could do something like that. Our next meeting is May, I believe it's May 10th at 7.30. The time is now 9.09. .09. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night.